we invite you all to join other two webinars and you may see uh, the further information in our website that will be shared in the chat box. So <clears throat> countries around the world uh, are in the crucial intersection in facing climate crisis. These progresses are all necessary, but we must put center the principle of justice at the center of the transition. As we transition to the greener energy, the Pulitzer supported journalists have uncovered the job losses and unfulfilled workers' rights and health in some countries. Our first session is going to discuss the labor realities in energy transition sector. So we have two Our Work and Environment grantees, uh, Flavia Lopez and Pawan Jot Kaur. Uh, welcome. So the first uh, speaker is Flavia. Uh, Flavia Lopez is a researcher and journalist covering the environment and climate change, as well as Pulitzer Center grantees. Uh, she is a German Chancellor Fellow at the Alexander hum von Humboldt Foundation, conducting research on energy transition in Germany and India. So, Flavia, uh, the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Grantee, for the lovely introduction. Uh, can we have the presentation in the background? Yes, I think it's coming. Okay. Ah, okay. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, one of the story that I reported with another journalist, Prakati Ravi, supported by Pulitzer Center. Uh, and this is the story about one of India's largest solar park uh, and the labor realities uh, in the Pawagada solar park. So a little background about the region, as you can see in this image. Uh, Pawagada is a region in the southern part of India. Uh, formerly an agrarian economy. Um, it was once a site of left-wing extremism in the country. Uh, but in 2015, a massive solar pa uh, park project was con uh, conceived in Pawagada. Can we uh, put the next slide? Uh, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, so uh, over 13,000 acres of land, which is roughly around 5,000 hectares of land, a uh, solar park was conceived in 2015 in Pawagada. Uh, and the park was uh, generates 2,500 megawatts of energy and was supposed to provide employment to 10,000 locals uh, in the region. Uh, however, what we found in our ground reporting was that uh, the park hasn't even created over 2,000 jobs uh, compared to the 10,000 that it has pro uh, promised. But more than the employment issue, what we found uh, was that in whatever little jobs that the park created, it has perpetuated existing systemic inequalities across gender and caste barriers. Uh, so I'm going to elaborate on both our findings uh, uh, eventually, but can we move on to the next slide? Uh, so here you can see stacks, piles of papers lying, uh, and these are nothing but CVs that have been accumulated over the years. Um, and a lot of locals applied for jobs, but uh, the park failed to create the jobs that it promised. Can we move on to the next image? Uh, so the park is developed by the Karnataka Solar Power Development Corporation. It's a special purpose vehicle uh, that was created by the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy in India uh, to develop this park. And this is the massive office that was created in 2015, uh, which acts more or less like a political theater for foreign dignitaries uh, to show India's global achievements in renewable energy and in harnessing solar power. Uh, this is the image that we created, uh, which shows how local youths have been running around uh, sending in their CVs to get jobs within the solar park. Um, moving on to the next image. Uh, so talking about the issue of unemployment uh, that is persistent in the region. Uh, so here you can see uh, men idling around. 
uh, during daytime. So in 2015, when the park project was conceived, a lot of men from the village migrated back, uh, hoping for job opportunities. And initially they were given uh, odd jobs in the uh, park construction, also to lure them to give up their land to the park project. Uh, however, when the park was developed in 2019, a lot of these jobs went away and a lot of technical jobs were created. So people whose background was in business administration or in banking were left without any jobs. So this was a major letdown uh, for a lot of these people. But some also saw this as an opportunity to position themselves in the new solar economy. So whatever capital that they had already, uh, they bought in JCBs and excavators and new technologies that could enable them to get contracts uh, within the solar park. Uh, and once they got contracts, they started employing people within the communities. So people who largely got jobs were also people who belong to dominant caste communities within the uh, villages. So if you see uh, Indian village structure, Indian village structure has hierarchy based on caste. Um, and dominant caste communities hold a lot of land holding within the villages. Uh, so considering that they had immense land holding and that they gave up uh, huge land holding for the park projects, they were preferred over people who didn't have uh, a lot of land holding. Can we move on to the next image? Um, so um, a lot of youth started getting education um, in technical degrees uh, as well, such as industrial training degrees or engineering. But within the competitive process, a lot of migrant laborers, not locals, uh, got in jobs simply because they had better degrees. Uh, and even within the region, there's only one institute that caters to industrial training. So youths did, do not have a lot of opportunity to get technical education. Um, but what kept a lot of these people afloat was also that they got, uh, uh, what kept them afloat was also be that they had money coming from land lease. Uh, so how the land lease structure works is that every year they get annual rent uh, and people who uh, leased like, acres or hectares worth of land got good amount, good chunk of money uh, that ke kept them sustained. But who lost in the process was people who belong to lower caste communities and women. Uh, so a lot of unskilled positions were left for lower caste men. Um, and these unskilled positions included panel cleaning and grass cutting, um, and which they deemed more or less as unsafe and easily replaceable positions. Unsafe because lately there have been a lot of incidents of snake bites, uh, snake bites in the solar plants. Uh, easily replaceable also because if it rained, a lot of panel cleaners, cleaners are not called in for their jobs. So uh, there's not a lot of security in the jobs that they get. Um, also, a lot of children from these lower caste communities could not afford to get technical education uh, in the absence of social capital and financial generational wealth uh, to invest in uh, uh, technical education. Can we uh, move on to the next slide? Uh, so this is an image that you can see. Uh, so these two photos have been taken at the same time. Um, so there have been regular power cuts in the village. And at the one hand, you see uh, villagers who don't have light. But at, on the other side, you see the park premises lit uh, with lights. Uh, can we move on to the next image? Yeah. Uh, okay. So who lost in the entire process was women. Uh, so because uh, women were not given jobs within the park premises, citing safety reasons. Uh, so in absence of jobs in the park premises, a lot of women had to migrate uh, to other towns to do their work and come back because the families were within the villages. Here you can see women coming from uh, another village which is across the state border. Can you play the video? I'm 
uh so a lot of so for a lot of this women this added to the existing household responsibilities uh, along with doing jobs uh, which were not within the locality um another set of people who lost uh is uh, nomadic herders who depended on who depended on the agricultural land for grazing but now had to sneak in or cut down on their livestock uh because they had no land to graze on um can we move on to the next slide so the social impact of all of this has been that in the idle hours you find these men or youths in the village gambling or playing cards or uh, locally called espit or jua these are terms uh, that are associated with as a proxy of lack of gainful employment or fulfilling employment opportunities another social impact that we came across is that in the absence of jobs a lot of youths have found it difficult to get themselves married and marriage prospects have decreased uh so broadly these are some of the different impacts that unemployment and uh absence of like mobility in job opportunities has created within the solar park premises in pavagada uh, academics largely broadly refer to this phenomena as jobless growth in a sense that there's growth and there's money flowing in from the land that they have leased but there are not enough jobs and fulfilling employment prospects for locals to engage in so yes yeah right uh flafia is at the end of your presentation i believe right thank you so much for the great insight uh from india and flafias and so much that we can learn from now we have another pulitzer grantees uh that have been working relentlessly covering perspectives from different communities in india uh pawan jatkaur is an independent journalist media content producer and filmmaker with 8 years experience in media So um we would like to start with some of the questions uh Pawan with the reporting that you're currently doing in Jharkhand India what major changes or transitions are taking place uh can you tell us about the realities faced by workers or communities based on your reporting and what realities that struck you the most thanks Pawan thank you Krenti thank you Flavia for the really nice presentation Uh, thank you for the questions grandi once again um so i would like to begin by describing uh, briefly the geography of jharkhand um it's in the eastern part of india and that's where my work for the last two years has been focused and it's still ongoing the project the film project um jharkhand is one of the largest coal mining areas in the country and within jharkhand my work uh, was focused in three districts and one of the districts is called ramgarh it's not one of the very famous districts that gets covered usually when it comes to <clears throat> coal mining uh, but why i decided to um, pick ramgarh as my study area was uh, one of the pe- very peculiar things that i noticed was that Uh, as on today over 50% coal mines uh, have uh, uh, are sh- shut down in ramgarh they are closed and uh, closed would be a better word it they are more or less abandoned and but these shutdowns the closures that have happened in ramgarh have happened because of operational reasons and not not because of uh, a, a planned transition that has uh, you know that's taking place it's because of operational reasons so for example some mines stop generating profit uh, the infrastructure of some was not up to the mark and in some cases the mine naturally ran out of coal so it naturally shut down now the current challenges faced by the local population as a result of these mine closures even if they were because of operational reasons can in my opinion an understanding 
is that these uh, uh, these results can become a guide on how mind closures should or should not happen in the future. Um, because of these closures, what has happened is that one, the area in the district now look like ghost towns because like I said, the mines have just been left abandoned. Uh, obviously, there has been large scale unemployment among populations and the market landscape. So, you know, shops, tea stalls that would otherwise be bustling because of the working mine in the area are now deserted. Now, um, the other thing, uh, you know, that the mine closures in this particular area um, uh, has done is that none of the mines have followed the standard operating procedure of a mine closure that a mine company must adhere to. So, of course, like I said, it has hurt the landscape of the area because the mines are just left abandoned idly as per the guidelines. The mine must, if it's an open, open cast mine where, uh, you know, then they have to fill it, then hand the land, land over to the farmers back again. Or if it's an underground mine, it has to be closed properly with, uh, uh, you know, the guidelines that are available, but that has not happened. So this is how it has hurt the landscape. Then what the other thing is that it has hurt workers. Like I said, it has caused large scale unemployment. While some of the formal uh, workers who were employed with the mines um, under they were on the payroll of the mines, they were some of them were transferred. Some of them naturally, you know, they retired um, and some were given severance packages. So that was in some aspect taken care of. However, uh, the informal workers that are associated with the mines and you know in India there is a lot of peripheral work around uh, especially in coal mining and uh, uh, so, so the peripheral work involves a lot of informal workers so for example truck loaders um, truck loaders that uh, loaders who load trucks with piles of you know heaps of coal the second thing is the drivers of the trucks. Then we have coal washers in the washeries. We have cleaners. Um, so so the informal workers felt the pinch because all of this peripheral work around the mine stopped. And one of the things that I witnessed was that, um, you know, in uh, it, it's there in news reports, but it's all interrelated, is that some of the casual workers or informal workers when the mine was just abandoned and not shut properly adhering to a procedure was that they would still go let's say in an underground mine to gather coal and sell it in the black market and these attempts to go and scavenge whatever coal is left is you know has led to roofs collapsing in some area and leading to you know mishaps so this is one of the challenges of um, 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 of a mine closure that has happened in an area because of certain operational reasons, because if mines have stopped becoming profitable and how it has led to, how it has hurt the local economy, the informal workers working in the area. So, so I, what I want to say here is that in my understanding of the area was that this offers, this place offers a sample of, you know, maybe how a mine closure should happen or how we should think about it because it already presents some of the fallouts of, uh, uh, you know, random mine closures that have happened. Um, now, talking about informal workers, uh, it brings me to another challenge of these, uh, you know, uh, the, three, the, the three districts, including Ramgarh, and the other two, uh, one is Dhanbad, and the other one is Bokaro. Now, um, the sprawling number of informal workers is a common challenge, uh, you know, across the Indian economy and specifically in the coal sector. Um, and uh, the challenge of informal workers is also very unique to countries like India and not so much in the West. So it's a very unique, you know, uh, I would say India and probably even a South Asia uh, challenge. Um, one, they are sprawling in number. Second, there is limited data available on how, uh, on the exact numbers of informal workers employed or, uh, or dependent, I would say, on this, um, you know, uh, pollution generating industry, uh, so to say, you know, coal mining. And so there's hardly any documentation of how they are engaged with coal work. You know, what are they doing? 
what are their terms i mean there are no terms because they are casual workers and uh, even even in terms of wages there is no solid data on what are their wages you know it, it varies from area to area it varies from mine to mine and you know it, it's just uh, um uh, it, it's uh, it's not recorded like i said so there is no data on what's happening really and but what is recorded uh, in anecdotes and and even reporting journalists reporting uh, reports of academics is that uh, almost all informal workers they come from a background of abject poverty or they are facing abject poverty and they're not educated they have poor skills um however uh, as per the uh, you know the, the latest data available with us about informal workers and not just in coal sector but across india the data is available to journalists from 2012 which is uh, an outdated figure and this is not a contested claim it is an outdated figure and so the recommendation from academics uh, to tackle uh, informal workers and their pool uh, you know to provide a safety net to this pool of people is to to start thinking of having an empirical household district level village level data of uh, how they are engaged what they are doing how many are they what are the wages they are earning what are the skills they have you know to have this kind of a data for uh, you know eventually uh, drafting uh, uh, you know a, a, however we are drafting it to you know easily draft a socially viable Uh, and what we call you know an economically just energy transition plan so this so this challenge of informal workers in the coal sector uh, right now has a vertical of gender and that also brings me to the second challenge that we face uh, as as far as coal workers or coal labor in jharkhand is concerned so so in uh, the informal uh, workers pool there are more men than women and for women who are engaged in coal work coal based informal work this work is some work in the face of no work and in the face of no income generation in almost all cases so coal based employment is in fact uh, empowering a community of women that i met with and um, this is a community of women in dhanbad Uh, who work as truck loaders for uh, almost uh, six to nine months every year, and um, there are other months in the year when this coal loading work stops <clears throat> because of the monsoon season. So when I met them, uh, these women said that you know um, during the monsoon their household income takes a hit because then one earning member is unable to earn. and one one interesting thing that they told me is that when this work stops we are unable to buy the gifts that we want to buy for ourselves so 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 this coal based work um which uh, um you know informally they are engaged with without any social protection is in fact giving them some financial independence when it comes to women's engagement and so that's why this community of women are not forthcoming towards avenues of uh, alternative skill training programs in the village like knitting and stitching that could eventually help them find work with you know, you know small home based industries or cottage industries in the area and so so the challenge here is that the social reality is so layered um that that to convince a community that they're capable of dignified forms of employment they're capable of alternative skill uh, training programs so that they can engage uh, with these skills uh, while uh, you know this skill will mean i mean acquiring these skills will mean more time and more commitment but to convince that this is going to be a long term skill uh, that could help them in the future have a safety net for them Uh, is a challenge and uh, there are other community leaders their counterparts women counterparts who are uh, trying to mobilize these women they're telling them that you know come to our center learn stitching you know you can then be a part of this small cottage based industry that we will eventually try to run and get the money for but they are not convinced because they, we can't see anything you know we're mm. not interested in the mobilization 
Um, right. Can I continue? Very good. Okay. Yes, uh, Pawan, thank you so much uh, for your insights and uh, 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 sharing with us about uh, the improper fossil energy mine that has hampered the locals. Uh, maybe we can, uh, you can share more in the next session because the time is up actually. So thank you so much, Pawan. So now uh, we can move on to the next session uh, on the urgency of our policy framework. So after learning these realities from uh, these two journalists, Pulitzer Center supported journalists Flavia and Pawan, we want to learn further from our uh, two great speakers as well. Uh, first, we have uh, Bapak Bagus Santoso. So Bapak Bagus Santoso is the head of training and development at the Coalition of the Indonesian Labor Unions or Gabungan Serikat Buruh Indonesia. Uh, GSBI is an organization that coordinates Indonesian labor unions in various sectors in an effort to lead advocacy and ensure labor rights. Uh, please, Bapak Bagus, uh, you may take the floor. Silakan, Bapak Bagus. Oke, okay. uh, terima kasih, Bang Trenti. Uh, apakah bisa ditampilkan slide saya? Uh, <coughs> Jonathan, can you please uh, share the presentation, please? Om Pak Bagus, terima kasih. Thank you. Oke, okay. uh, terima kasih semuanya, kawan-kawan. Selamat pagi dan selamat malam. Uh, ya, yeah, saya uh, akan mulai dari sedikit ini, uh, berdasarkan dari laporan singkat yang kita uh, organisasikan di JP, uh, bicara tentang dampak dari krisis iklim dan transisi energi yang tidaknya di, di Indonesia ini. Nah, uh, saya awali dari uh, bagaimana pemerintah Indonesia untuk me, me, apa ya uh, membuat roadmap untuk <tuh> uh, transisi energi yang akan dijalankan. Uh, saya mulai dari <tuh> hasil dari pertemuan di G20 di Bali di tahun 2022. Ya. Uh, kemudian ditindaklanjuti oleh pemerintah Indonesia uh, bagaimana uh, skema ataupun skema transisi di Indonesia akan di, di, dimulai uh, dengan menjalankan skema uh, JT. Nah, uh, pemerintah Indonesia kemudian di tahun 2023, Desember ini, itu mengeluarkan dokumen uh, di mana Transisi energi itu akan di, 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 dijalankan, ya, di, dijalankan uh, dengan mengacu pada dokumen tersebut, yaitu uh, dokumen rencana investasi dan kebijakan komprehensif. Uh, sebagaimana kemudian di Desember kemarin, di Desember kemarin itu di, uh, ditetapkan uh, dan dikeluarkan, termasuk kemudian dikonsultasikan publik. Nah. Saya mulai dari itu dan kemudian menyoroti uh, dokumen ini uh, saya kasih gambar aja pada intinya di Indonesia transisi energi itu tidak dilakukan secara transparan dan tidak partisipasi karena penyusunan roadmap dokumen uh, di uh, bagaimana transisi energi yang akan dijalankan sampai pada target eh, emisi nol emisi karbon itu dicapai di tahun 2050 ya setelah sebelumnya 2060 oleh pemerintah Indonesia kemudian uh, melalui uh, dokumen CIPP ini kemudian uh, di, di, di percepat untuk kemudian tahun 2050 itu akan mencapai uh, nol emisi karbon. Nah uh, dokumen ini sangat penting kedudukannya karena akan mencelaraskan 
bagaimana uh, riset yang ada di nasional ataupun kemudian kerjasama-kerjasama yang akan dilakukan oleh pemerintah Indonesia dengan pihak-pihak uh, uh, luar ya, untuk kemudian untuk kemudian uh, percepatan percepatan uh, uh, transisi uh, energi yang 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 yang, uh, yang bersih gitu ya uh, kemudian digunakan. Nah pertama dalam konteks pembuatan dokumen ini itu uh, hanya dilakukan konsultasi publik sebanyak tiga kali menurut catatan JSB itu dilakukan hampir semuanya di bulan Juni tanggal 12 19 sampai 20 dan tanggal 27 Juni 2023 itu kemudian di bulan Desember itu kemudian dilakukan secara apa namanya eh, dilakukan konsolidasi konsultasi publik nah problematik pertama adalah eh, penyusunan dokumen ini eh, keterhubungannya dengan dampak punya ke depan terhadap ketenaga kerjaan di Indonesia. Sama sekali eh, konsultasi publik yang dilakukan tidak merepresentasikan eh, bagaimana unsur-unsur dari ketenaga kerjaan, baik kemudian itu eh, stakeholder yang kemudian dari serikat buru sendiri ataupun dari buru itu sendiri, termasuk kemudian kelembagaan di dalam kementerian eh, ketenaga kerjaan di Indonesia itu eh, tidak merepresentasikan eh, dokumen ini menjadi bagian dari eh, dari Dokumen ini kemudian mengintegrasikan atau me, me, memberikan kesempatan-kesempatan bagi stakeholder yang ada di dalam ketenaga kerjaan itu menjadi uh, memberikan kemudian uh, pandangan pendapatnya termasuk memberikan hal-hal yang kemudian uh, uh, ke depan bisa jadi mengancam kemudian kehilangannya pekerjaan dan segala macamnya. Sebab dari dari serikat buruh yang dalam konteks konfederasi di Indonesia yang jumlahnya uh, sekarang ini. Uh, sorry, di tahun 2021 kemarin itu uh, jumlahnya 14 konfederasi. Dari 14 itu hanya satu konfederasi yang kemudian dilibatkan di dalam konsultasi publik untuk penyusunan dokumen ini. Selain itu, ada banyak uh, sekitar ratusan federasi serikat buruh di Indonesia ini tidak kemudian terlibat. Dan salah satu yang tidak dilibatkan uh, uh, adalah GSBI. Itu, itu pertama. Kemudian, Kementerian Ketenagakerjaan sendiri dalam penyusunan dokumen itu tidak di, tidak dilibatkan. Oke, okay, uh, selanjutnya. Nah, uh, berdasarkan dari dokumen yang disusun ini, uh, apa uh, pekerjaan baru yang dijanjikan oleh pemerintah. Uh, <tuh> di dalam dokumen CIPP ini digambarkan kemudian dengan uh, menjalankan proyek-proyek uh, untuk uh, produksi energi baru terbarukan gitu. ada uh, LTS kemudian uh, tenaga LTA dan segala macamnya itu uh, itu akan terdapat sekitar 383 ribu pekerjaan. Nah uh, dokumen ini itu mendapatkan banyak kritikan terutama dari CSO di, di Indonesia dari berbagai CSO itu. Nah salah satu yang saya kutip dari kritik oleh CSO yang ada di Indonesia mengenai dari uh, tentang uh, jumlah pekerjaan baru ini di dalam uh, apa namanya pendapatnya kawan-kawan uh, pandangan dan sikapnya kawan-kawan di CSO di, di NGO di Indonesia ini uh, mengenai uh, pekerjaan baru jadi terdapat kritik di mana kemudian uh, perhitungan pekerjaan yang hilang dan penciptaan pekerjaan baru itu sangat tidak jelas dan dokumen CIPP ini tidak memberikan jalur untuk mengatasi hal itu kritik di mana kemudian uh, disampaikan tiba-tiba uh, muncul kemudian di dokumen ini uh, tidak menghitung kemudian uh, memperkirakan berapa jumlah pekerjaan yang hilang dan uh, yang apa namanya uh, secara keseluruhan baik baik kemudian di dalam uh, sub subsektor daripada uh, pekerjaan yang, yang yang ada di Indonesia ini tiba-tiba dia memunculkan kemudian uh, 383.000 pekerjaan baru itu akan diciptakan ketika kemudian uh, Indonesia mem mem memulai uh, transisi energi dalam skenario JP. Uh, uh, 4 menit lagi ya Pak Pak Bagus 4 menit lagi ya mohon izin. Salah satu, ya salah satu masalahnya juga dari yang dimaksud dari jumlah 383.000 pekerjaan ini itu pekerjaannya atau jumlah tenaga kerja yang kemudian uh, terciptakan di situ di dalam dokumen CIPP itu juga tidak 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 jelas kemudian disebutkan bahkan uh, 
kritikan daripada dokumen ini disampaikan oleh berbagai banyak NGO eh, mulai dari eh, memberikan satu naskah eh, kritiknya yang di, disampaikan secara langsung ke JEPI dan juga ke Halo Pak Bagus, uh, Bapak di uh, masih kemiut? Ya. Ya oke. Okay. Ya, uh, saya ada gambar gitu. Nah, uh, <tuh> bahkan dari beberapa uh, NGO termasuk organisasi masyarakat yang lain, sejak kemudian di, di konsultasikan publik dan kemudian di, di launching secara publik dokumen ini, ada beberapa teman-teman uh, termasuk organisasi masyarakat. Uh, itu juga kemudian melakukan aksi untuk kemudian memberikan respon terhadap uh, ketidakjelasan daripada uh, dokumen ini, di mana dokumen ini itu, uh, ke depan akan menjadi roadmap uh, dalam jangka panjang, setidaknya 30 tahun ke depan. Gitu. Okay, next. Satu next. menit lagi ya Pak Bagus. Ya. Okay. Satu menit lagi ya Pak. Ah, ya, okay. makasih Pak. Nah, ini gambaran dari uh, apa namanya EBT. Uh, di Indonesia yang jumlahnya sangat besar kebutuhan nasional yang di yang dibutuhkan untuk kebutuhan nasional sekarang ini uh, jumlahnya tidak lebih dari 20 persen dari EBT yang terbarukan sehingga sebenarnya Indonesia sendiri untuk membuat uh, memproduksi EBT itu uh, bisa 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 jauh lebih uh, besar dan bahkan berlebih gitu cadangan oke okay, next nah ini JSWI uh, melihat kemudian ada tiga sektor utama uh, dari rencana uh, transisi energi ini yang kemudian akan berdampak pada hilangnya pekerjaan, terutama di sektor industri pertambangan, khususnya tambang batu bara dan uh, pengadaan listrik, khususnya di PLTU dan industri pengelolaan. Tiga sektor itu akan punya dampak yang signifikan. Uh, Oke, okay, next, selanjutnya. Nah, uh, salah satunya kehilangan pekerjaan. Uh, Next, next, next. Uh, slide, slide selanjutnya. Lagi. Nah, uh, kita perkirakan di tiga sektor ini, itu jumlah kehilangan pekerjaan uh, itu mencapai 1 juta sampai 1 juta 800, hampir 2 juta uh, apa, uh, buruh kehilangan pekerjaan. Ada di sektor uh, tambang batu bara, PLTU, dan juga industri pengolahan di mana di industri pengolahan ini itu bahkan uh, uh, ter tergambar untuk kemudian uh, hilangnya pekerjaan itu dengan industri-industri manufaktur yang kemudian sekarang ini banyak memasang uh, PLTS, uh, kemudian dibarengi dengan modernisasi mesin dan terjadi efisiensi uh, tenaga kerjanya. Sehingga kemudian dari uh, kayak misalkan satu bagian sebelumnya lima orang itu menjadi tiga orang, karena kemudian terjadi penambahan kapasitas listrik karena sumber listrik yang dari PLTU itu di industri-industri manufaktur sekarang ini itu tidak berkurang gitu konsumsinya dengan pemasang PLTS itu semakin juga kemudian menambah uh, kapasitas mesinnya. Jadi uh, poin berikutnya juga soal industri di, di manufaktur khususnya di sektor knalpot pada kebijakan tertentu uh, dalam konteks ekstrim kebijakan tertentu ke depan ini. Uh, industri penalpot ini terancam akan hilang gitu. Yang jumlahnya di Indonesia itu uh, pekerja di, 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 di sini itu uh, mencapai angka 250 ribu, hampir hampir 300 ribu pekerja. Karena ketika kemudian pemerintah uh, hari ini ya, memfokuskan termasuk kemudian uh, perkembangan uh, apa yang yang energi listrik kendaraan yang kemudian digenjot di sekarang ini. Nah, itu uh, pada kebijakan tertentu ke depan mobil listrik ataupun motor listrik itu itu tidak menggunakan knalpot ya. Nah, di industri ini hmm. itu pasti akan gulung tikar dan jumlahnya ada sekitar 300.000 300.000 pekerja yang ada di sektor ini itu akan hilang pekerjaan. Baik, nah, Pak uh, Bagus, uh, okay. mohon maaf karena waktunya sudah habis, mungkin kita bisa lanjutkan uh, diskusinya di section berikutnya, Pak. Nanti mungkin Bapak bisa okay. mensummarize ya sisa dari presentasinya di section berikutnya okay. saat concluding statement ya. ya uh, okay. Terima kasih okay. Pak Bagus uh, for the very important insights about the struggle of the workers in the energy transition yeah. in Indonesia that might be applicable to some other countries in other global south. 
Uh, we are now welcoming our final speaker, uh, Sabrina Fernandez. So Sabrina is a Brazilian sociologist and political economist focusing on transition Latin America and internationalism. She's the head of research at the Alameda Institute with a PhD from Carleton University, Canada. She has researched transitions and ecology for over a decade with expertise on Latin America. Formerly a postdoctoral fellow with the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung and with Kalas in Guadalajara. She was also an editor at Jacobin and chief editor of Jacobin Brazil. Her books and articles cover various fields and her publication can be found in English, Portuguese, Spanish, and other languages. So uh, we can invite you all to visit her website. So Sabrina, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Granti. Um, do you have the presentation over there? Uh, yes, it's coming, uh, I believe. Perfect. Well, thank you all for having me. Uh, thank you to all those attending from many different parts in the world. Uh, so this is actually very exciting. Uh, we can get a conversation going that connects uh, struggles and challenges, but also solutions in many different places. I'll also try to uh, weave in some of the things that were raised uh, in the Q&A, I believe by João Marcos, because I think some of the questions here connect to, to some of the things that I want to discuss. Um, and I want to go back to the point of just transition and how we understand green jobs in this scenario. So can we move on to the next one? Perfect. Um, we have some, we have, let me just, I was asked to add something here, confirm my speaking language, sorry. Um, we have a few definitions that are in the playbook around just transition and how jobs connect to just, transi just transition. They have been in the works for a really long time. So they, they've been pushed for uh, coming from unions because of this worry about potential job losses. So not only in oil and gas and coal, but talking about job losses in general, but the energy focus has always been there because not just uh, around energy infrastructure, but the actual generation of energy and the distribution of energy. This uh, has created a bit of a, a challenge for us because many times when we're talking about jobs in the ecological transition or in the climate element of the transition. So when we're talking about decarbonizing society, but not only reducing greenhouse gases as much as possible to fight climate change, we end up focusing on energy. Um, but if we go back to the definitions when we're talking about a, a transition to environmentally sustainable economy and society, which is the way that the International Labor Organization has employed this before, we can uh, actually start to problematize a little bit and like move forward from just the energy element. And this will help us understand places where a focus uh, on green energy jobs is actually hurting other types of jobs in the local economies, which is something that I wanna get to um, and uh, at, at the end of my, my 10 minutes, I hope, right? But here we're talking about uh, net gains in total employment. So it's not just about replacing old jobs with newer jobs, but also increasing the job availability, making sure that these are decent jobs, so they're not precarious jobs, making sure that you have actual improvements in job quality and they connect to other sectors as well. So for example, agriculture, construction, recycling, tourism, and so on, and social inclusion. So the rest of the society uh, should be um, represented in this, in this matter. And then there's a uh, next slide. There's a document um, that was produced by the Central Unica dos Trabalhadores, which is the biggest um, union uh, federation in Brazil, CUTI, uh, talking about just transition. So decent, work is actually very emphasized throughout, but also there are things, for example, we like um, formalizing uh, work in the just transition connected to communities, uh, helping communities that have been affected by climate disasters. So in a sense, it's about expanding our definition of green jobs as well. So uh, those people who are working in the adaptation or they're working in loss and damage, 
um, the state where I live here in Brazil. Um, just during the weekend, we had deaths and people who lost absolutely everything because of um, basically raining in one hour, the equivalent of what should be raining for an entire month. So these type of disasters that we know that are coming and are already happening uh, in terms of extreme weather events connect connected to climate change, the jobs connected to that, we're providing assistance, with helping to prevent the disasters, these are also green jobs. So I really like the, the way that Gucci has tried to frame this in terms of a just transition. So we actually understand that green job creation we will have the energy element because the energy transition is absolutely necessary if we're going to do away with fossil fuels, if we're actually going to emphasize um, our strategy for fossil fuel phase out, but they need to be connected to these other sectors. Next slide. This means in the end that what we're trying to do is to coordinate across multiple transitions. Energy is very, very necessary, like I said, but if we only focus on energy here, we could be hindering the reduction of other types of emissions. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, basically overlooking what's happening with, with methane, what's happening in uh, uh, emissions coming from agriculture, from land use and uh, deforestation. And if we're only focusing on that, we could also, also be creating a few traps uh, in the sense uh, that uh, the energy element of it is not just about building, generating, and infrastructure is also connected uh, to other sectors, for example, transportation and mining. Um, this is uh, important for us to bring, uh, bring up right now uh, because right now we understand that there's a problem with what we call carbon tunnel vision in the way that we look into transitions. So it's just about decarbonizing and the problems are being created. We'll deal with them later on. But we should be dealing with them right now because primarily from a, a labor uh, situation, there are places where the creation of green energy jobs um, is, means the destruction of local economies or means displacement or means environmental distress. And we need to avoid this at all costs, especially because we don't want the damages to happen and we don't want the people who are being negatively affected by the generation of these jobs to become communities. They are not just sacrifice zones, but they're opposed to the green transition that we need to that we need to promote. Next. So just to bring up some data here, right? We're uh when we're talking about transitioning the jobs, then we need to look into in, in and outside the energy sector. If we just play it in terms of like energy directly, you can see that there's been um, a big push in the past few years in terms of expanding renewables. So we would have like the job creation from 2020 to 2023, you, you actually have a complete change in tendency here. This does not mean, however, that this tendency can be kept up with current investment, because a lot of the job creation connected to clean energy is also temporary. We're talking about construction, civil construction jobs more than anything, like investing in infrastructure. Um, we're talking with um, uh, consultations uh, and training from the from the beginning. And we need to understand that if we're actually going to have like a a, a, a bigger approach to the green jobs, we can't rely just on these temporary energy jobs. Next. Uh, another problem that we have uh, regards data and definitions within the energy transition debate. Sometimes the mining jobs are included, sometimes they're not. So like this is an example here coming from the, from the Ye Yale Climate Connection where the extractive industry connected to strategic minerals, for example, lithium, cobalt, they're not considered uh, jobs. In fact, they say that the fossil fuel industry has extractive occupations and renewables don't. And I highly um, uh, disagree with this because uh, we, un we understand that a lot of these investments are going to the extractive industry and uh, they're actually being justified to create bad jobs in the extractive industry. Next. I think we got it. 
Uh, it's the getting to just is the other tab over there. Because I think there was a link in it and yeah. Uh, but just like to keep going so we don't waste a lot of time here. Uh, there's also a problem in terms of the distribution of jobs across the world. So you would have like jobs created in China. Uh, they're actually really pushing this trend. If we're considering like North America, Central and South America, you can see like that in North America, the transition is not that visible quite yet, right? So like there's a lot of concentration of fossil fuels, China, a lot in clean energy. Um, and uh, there are like places where you have just like new job creation. New job is not creation is uh, next. This means a couple of things here for us, and I'm going to try to be quick here. Um, the green jobs in the energy sector, uh, they're not necessarily the same thing as just renewable energy generation. We need to consider transportation, conservation, adaptation of energy, and the extractive industry. And we need to consider uh, the quality of these jobs and whether they're actually uh, jobs that we want to create if we're talking, for example, about green hydrogen in an area um, that could become a new sacrifice zone. There's a challenge in demanding training to transition because um, there are skills gaps, um, skills stagnation. For example, the, the, the oil and gas industry is a place where you find a lot of skill stagnation. So like getting people to train is already hard in that area, let alone to move them into green jobs. You have spatial challenges, like where are the jobs located? Um, you also have special cha uh, spatial challenges where, when you're talking about uh, job relocation around civil construction. So for example, for wind, uh, wind parks, uh, a lot of people go in, um, they're not hiring from the local force. They might, you might have targets uh, to hire about like 50% from the local job force, but then you're bringing people from other places, they come in, they stay for three years, then where, where are these jobs going? Oh, we're going to build another uh, wind park, uh, but then it's going to be across the state or the country. So there are a lot of challenges around that and huge challenges considering gender and racial gap. Um, and this is something that you uh, identify across the board. Um, the like so like there are situations you, you can move on to the next one there are situations where you find that the pay gap is starting to normalize between oil and gas and what would be renewables but you don't find that with the gender gap the gender gap is still very wide uh something else that's interesting to notice is that around the pay gap uh this is going to vary country to country so in brazil with GAS, you, you still kind of see that the, the renewable uh, sector uh, is uh, less unionized and because it's less unionized, you tend to have worse pay than oil and gas. In other places where unionization is rising, you can move on to the next one. Uh, uh, hey, Sabrina, can... uh, yes, so, yes. sorry, but the time is up. Uh, maybe you okay. can summarize in, in the next yeah, I can, I can, uh, section. I can... Okay. Yeah. okay. Okay. All right. And then you find... Well, I'm <laughs> okay. And then, uh, in terms of like what what you find here is that uh, in order for us to understand if these energy jobs they're actually good jobs, if the green transition is working, we have a problem with data from the beginning. Each country it had like its different metrics. Uh, Irina uh, has different metrics from the IEA, uh, the ILO different metrics. So it's really hard for us to coordinate policy across the board internationally if we're not having like good comparison data. And this is something that has to do with definitions around just transition. This has to do with definitions around what the green job is, what industries are covered and the gaps around gender, race, but also uh, like the spatial gaps and whether these jobs are temporary or they're longer term or like uh, jobs. And we can end it here. Yeah. All right, thank you so much, Sabrina. Uh, now we are transitioning to the next section, which is about working together and what can we do uh, now that we have learned some of the challenges in the energy transition, the aspiration itself, solution from local realities in three different countries, India, Indonesia, and Brazil. We want to see how collaboration can form a helpful solution to these challenges, of course. So we would like to hear from uh, each of the speakers uh, so seeing these challenges uh, that are facing labor rights in this era of energy transition, 
how can civil society, academics, and media play a role? So who would like to go first? I can go if that's okay. Yeah, thank you so much, Pawan. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Priyanti. Um, I'll just quickly, um, so my interactions with the <clears throat> labor unions, excuse me, in Jharkhand was that at this point in India, uh, labor groups, uh, trade unions are trying to inform themselves because, uh, you know, uh, like uh, Bagu Santoso shared a document about what's happening. We don't have such a document as as yet. We don't have any consultations that have, that have started happening with workers and trade unions. So at this point, trade unions are just trying to be informed. What will happen? What is this? You know, how is it going to happen? So that, that's, that's one thing. Uh, <clears throat> what the what the media can do, um, you know, is that um, um, I would say, I, I don't want to make a, a statement of what the media can do, but but uh, but what I tried to do of these last two years was, you know, um, to uh, observe uh, you, you are, when you're part of, when you're in part of the community, you observe, uh, you are uh, listening to what the challenges are, um uh, you know and uh, um you, you know so you then you reflect then you present and what you present as a journalist is in is in the public interest so uh, you know i would say that the media must um, or the media can uh, take from this is that um, you know first when you when you learn you research you know so that i map jharkhand i map the community so i think it's really down to the detail you really go down to the detail and then you start observing. So when you when you are so as a journalist, when I go into the community, I'm not one of them. Uh, they know I'm not one of them. And <clears throat> I you have to observe, make friends to bridge that gap and learn from where they are coming from. How do they understand what a transition is? Most of them don't. Um, and uh, so and then when you reflect on it and then when you present it, it has to be in public interest. So so I think that's one thing, um, you know, when journalists reflect most of the times is why are you doing what you're doing um, is when you when I think uh, you're able to conclude that is it in the interest of the labor unions? Is it in the interest of the workers that you've just met? Uh, is it in the interest of larger policy framework solutions that you can add to? So I would say that these are some of the, you know, almost like checklist pointers, maybe probably that the media can um, do. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you, Pawan. So uh, who's up next that would like to share her thoughts, their thoughts? Um, I can go. Yes, sure. uh, okay. Yeah. So thank you, Pawan. Um, so based on my interactions with uh, different stakeholders, what I've gotten a sense is that in this era of energy transition, there seems to be a tremendous rush to get things done quickly, especially among policymakers who are inclined to move faster without thoroughly considering the implication. And this is where uh, it's crucial for civil society groups, academia and media to emphasize the importance of taking things slow and ensuring correctness and highlighting instances where wrong paths have been taken. Uh, based on my reporting in Pawagada, it's not that civil society has been absent in Pawagada. It's just civil society demands at this stage have been very basic. Like Pawan said, they are navigating as this transition unfolds. Um, and as they move forward, there needs to be more inclusivity, focusing on communities that often get left out of the conversation. And this inclusivity should extend across intersectionality. One of the things that I've come across is that women often, gender is one aspect that gets uh, out of normal conversations. Uh, and having been to Pawagada, uh, both as a researcher and, uh, and as a journalist, uh, I think both academia and media can work together in understanding uh, situations and in uh, grasping local dynamics uh, 
and transforming them into analysis. Um, as a journalist, uh, we have the privilege to reach to wider audiences. Uh, so generally in this broader conversations about energy transition, I think what we as a journalist could do is focus on more local stories that can balance what the local realities have been in the larger uh, energy transition discussions. So, yes. Thank you so much, Lafia. Maybe Sabrina and Orpa Bagus can also share their thoughts mm. about the collaboration. Yeah, mungkin saya melanjutkan. Silakan, Pak. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Uh, saya kira saya setuju dengan uh, Flavia tadi yang, yang pertama uh, untuk bagaimana uh, kita semua bisa menjadi bagian dari uh, kerangka uh, transisi energi yang berkeadilan dan termasuk uh, menjadi bagian dari uh, gerakan yang kemudian secara multisektor untuk kemudian bersama-sama uh, 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 membicarakan ini uh, dalam rangka baik secara di komunitas bahkan pada level di nasional. Nah, eh, keduanya eh, saya kira eh, penting juga untuk kemudian eh, serikat buruh eh, juga meng, eh, apa, meng, menginformasikan bahkan kemudian eh, menjadi satu kesatuan di dalam perangka eh, kerjasama dengan jurnalis termasuk mengkabarkan hal-hal yang kemudian berkaitan secara khususnya kalau bicara eh, di Indonesia. Eh, Dokumen yang disusun memang terlihat se seperti uh, apa satu hal yang akan menjadi jaminan bagi seluruh masyarakat Indonesia untuk kemudian uh, semacam dibilang tenang saja akan banyak kemudian pekerjaan baru yang yang akan lahir bahkan dua kali lipatnya sehingga kemudian uh, hilang pekerjaan pun itu akan uh, akan mendapat satu pekerjaan baru dan itu semuanya dalam rangka hal yang kosong besar. Uh, sebenarnya uh, kami menilai dan bagian daripada ini saya kira uh, kita akan terus mengkabarkan bersama dengan jurnalis termasuk kemudian kalangan sektor yang lainnya bahkan yang terlebih parah lagi kalau kita lihat klaim atas tambang-tambang uh, uh, nikel terutama di di Sulawesi uh, yang kemudian itu bagian daripada energi terbarukan uh, di tengah kemudian uh, itu yang diinformasikan oleh pemerintah ke fakta yang 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 konkret adalah uh, bagaimana itu semakin kemudian menciptakan landscape uh, atas lahan yang akan kerusakan lingkungan semakin parah termasuk kemudian tetap menggunakan energi fosil batu bara bahkan kemudian di dalam ketenaga kerjaan uh, di sana uh, kita mencatat sejak ber, uh, dibukanya tambang-tambang itu telah banyak memakan uh, korban termasuk meninggal dunia catatan kami sampai kemudian 60 pekerja meninggal dunia uh, karena uh, sistem K3, keselamatan kesehatan kerja di sana, sangat buruk. Uh, ada ratusan juga kemudian ke insiden-insiden kecelakaan kerja yang kemudian mengakibatkan luka-luka uh, luka berat itu terus kemudian bahkan tiap hari kita mendapat informasi itu uh, di sana. Maka uh, mengkabarkan soal ini itu akan jadi satu hal yang kemudian sentral untuk bekerja sama dengan semua sektor uh, <tuh> yang ada di Indonesia untuk kemudian perbaikan-perbaikan yang lebih uh, konkret termasuk kemudian dokumen ini akan menjadi satu uh, sorotan bagi GSI untuk kemudian lahirnya perbaikan-perbaikan baru tidak kemudian semata teks yang sangat baik tapi kekonkretan daripada roadmap itu akan roadmap tentang transisi energi itu akan jadi uh, menjadi uh, milik semua masyarakat Indonesia khususnya dan perbaikan-perbaikan uh, dalam job security, income security, termasuk social security itu menjadi satu konsentrasi yang akan jauh lebih uh, apa baik ke depan. Karena tanpa itu tidak ada tidak ada yang namanya uh, transisi yang ada. Saya kira itu tambahan saya, Pak uh, Tendi. Terima kasih. Thank you, Pak Bagus. Uh, maybe before we moving on to Sabrina. Uh, we do have received a question that related to uh, the energy transition in Sulawesi, Pak Bagus. Uh, saya boleh bacakan ya, Pak, ya. Mungkin Bapak bisa memberikan perspektif di sini. Uh, bagaimana narasumber yeah. melihat upaya transisi energi di sektor pertambangan, terutama di kawasan industri pertambangan di Morowali, Sulawesi Tengah? 
adakah upaya pelaku industri untuk memiliki konsep transisi energi hijau sedangkan pembangkit listrik masih menggunakan pembangkit listrik batu bara di kawasan industri nikel. Mungkin Bapak bisa share Pak mengenai kasus-kasus yang sudah Bapak ya. dengar. Ya, uh, saya kira sama sekali uh, bukan uh, energi hijau yang kemudian terjadi di, di, di sana ya. Uh, sedikit tadi saya sudah sampaikan bahwa uh, dari uh, apa uh, secara keseluruhannya uh, energi yang, yang yang digunakan untuk kemudian proses tambang itu dimulai tetap menggunakan uh, energi fosil uh, dan bahkan kemudian setiap pabrik-pabrik di sana itu yang kemudian juga mem- mem- membangun PLTU-nya sendiri yang semuanya itu mengkonsumsi batu bara dan itu memberikan satu kerusakan lingkungan yang cukup parah. Kami mendengar betul dan melihat betul uh, uh, situasi di sana. Bahkan terakhir di pas di Natal kemarin 25 Desember, uh, uh, ya itu terjadi kecelakaan kerja uh, di mana uh, apa uh, jumlah apa uh, sekitar 21 buruh meninggal dunia dan puluhan buruh kemudian uh, uh, luka-luka berat. Dan pelaku industri di sana sama sekali kemudian tidak uh, menempatkan kedudukan uh, salah satu hak-hak buruh itu menjadi satu bagian terintegrasi di dalam menjalankan transisi energi yang hasil. Kita tahu betul uh, bahkan uh, saat ini penyelidikan-penyelidikan atas uh, terjadinya satu insiden atau kita sebutnya tragedi maut uh, tentang K3 di, di sana sama, sama sekali kemudian tidak melihat satu sisi di mana uh, pengambil kebijakan di tingkat pabrik atau kemudian pengambil kebijakan di level tingginya satu uh, di posisi jabatan yang tinggi di, di satu perusahaan di sana itu menjadi satu uh, apa namanya konsentrasi uh, untuk pelanggaran daripada uh, uh, penerapan sistem K3 yang seharusnya itu menjadi bagian daripada uh, konsep di dalam transisi energi Uh, yang menjadi kewajiban dari satu perusahaan itu sama sekali tidak uh, di, 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 dijadikan satu apa namanya uh, prinsip di dalam uh, mempraktekkan kemudian uh, buat, uh, bisnis ataupun juga di dalam mereka dalam menarasikan bahwa itu bagian daripada konsep energi hijau dan salah satunya uh, daripada itu hingga kini kita mencatat hmm, bahkan kemudian di dalam konteks K3 di sana juga sendiri, uh, kita mendapatkan informasi bahwa yang disasar kemudian oleh penyelidikan-penyelidikan atau penyelidikasi yang dilakukan oleh pihak-pihak pemerintah, uh, baik kepolisian, kementerian tenaga kerja, dan segala macam, itu menyasar buruh yang kemudian bekerja di sana menjadi satu pelanggarnya. Itu kita mendapat informasi yang macam begitu. Konsep K3 ini tidak memberikan satu, apa, tidak dijadikan daripada prinsip untuk kemudian lagi apa di, di praktekannya kemudian uh, energi hijau uh, yang kemudian di, harusnya dijalankan oleh perusahaan. Uh, saya kira itu mungkin uh, respon yeah. saya. Yeah. terima kasih banyak Pak Bagus atas insightsnya. Uh, maybe we can move on to Sabrina if she has some final thoughts on the collaborations. Um, Hello, Sabrina. Okay, sorry, I was listening to the translation. Um, I yeah, I, I think where it comes from civil society, uh, there is a tendency to react. So there are these policies are coming and they're not to our liking. We need to resist them. And now we organize in reaction uh, to them. It's important to be ahead of what's happening. So like proposing suggesting. So um, this is a different challenge around organizing uh, because there are so many other issues, especially when we're talking about vulnerable communities. There are so many other issues that these communities are already facing to get them to organize before something comes, before something happens. Uh, And the way, probably like the best way to do this then is to embed the conversation around just transition and around job creation and what do these green energy infrastructure project, uh, projects mean in the already existing organizing spaces. So pl- places where you already have a struggle around biodiversity, where you're already fighting against um, 
the sacrifice zones produced by mining where you are already engaged in um, and uh, claiming other democratic rights around healthcare, around gender equality, trying to make sure that you're weaving the conversation of just transition in these other places. So, so you can uh, be producing the debate and be prepared before something that's um, disadvantageous, that's coming from a top-down approach, before that happens. So it is about creating the program and not just reacting around it. Uh, in, the, in the case of Latin America, we have some examples around that uh, in terms of uh, transition framework. So like the eco-social pact from the South is an example of this across many, many countries in, in Latin America. Uh, in the Amazonian region, there is some experience around uh, resisting, but at the same time, it tended to be so focused on fighting deforestation that now the biome, it's being uh, priv uh, like a privileged target for carbon markets uh, in Brazil and across all nine states in the area. So that's why it's important to interconnect all of these points rather than just like fo focusing on one thing only. Thank you, Sabrina. Uh, I think it's the good time also for you to respond to one of the questions from Marcos. Uh, how do you think the energy transitions can happen in a capitalistic dominant mode of production, considering its reliance on the predictability of fossil fuels to operate continuous production? In other words, is it possible to witness a massive and meaningful energy transition towards less polluting and renewable sources in capitalist societies. I'm good at uh, answering all of them in writing. Uh, so I could just kind of like emphasize uh, one of the points there. Uh, we're witnessing diversification, not transition. When we look into this data around, you know, lots of green jobs in clean energy going up and fossil fuels going down, it does look like transition, but that's not how it is because a lot of these jobs are temporary and it's common for you to have a boost when you're having new investment in infrastructure. Um, but transition cannot be measured just in that way. We need to look into in terms of output. And we, what we understand is that there is a push for renewables, but there's not the, the, the pace of phasing out fossil fuels is not comparable at all because there's no phase out. What we're having is um, a bit of a, a slowdown in a couple of regions where you have a, a bigger commitment, but in general, you have more countries joining, for example, OPEP or OPEP plus. Uh, so an, an expansion around fossil fuels that they want to abate, compensate through the carbon market or something like, for example, using green hydrogen as uh, an ingredient uh, for the oil refineries rather than regular, you know, carbon based uh, hydrogen. So our emissions from fossil fuels won't be as high. Um, and this is something that we're seeing a lot of corporations like from public uh, to private corporations around oil and gas just arguing that, well, our, our oil and gas, they're not going to be uh, the big emitters. They, they're not going to emit that much. So it's the good, the good kind. So there's some level of greenwashing there. And there's also like this, something that I find kind of cruel. So like this use of renewables to actually feedback into the fossil fuel industry rather than using these renewables for energy democracy purposes. So like taking, for example, electricity to people who never had it before. So like for the first time already uh, getting access through the renewables. Right, great, uh, Sabrina. So we are now can transition to the final section on the closing statements. Uh, it has been a very important insights and great learning from you all the speakers. So we would like to hear from all of the panelists. Uh, what is the panelist message to workers around the world and those working in the energy transition sector? So who want to start first? Pa Bagus, maybe? Yeah. Okay. Uh, terima kasih, uh, Green Tea. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> yang pertama, uh, bagi kami, tidak ada yang namanya transisi energi tanpa 
kemudian merubah ketimpangan yang ada saat ini. Ketimpangan baik kemudian secara ekonomi yang berbasis juga terhadap uh, ras, sukuan, dan uh, keumuman daripada tata kelola uh, lahan dan tanah yang ada di, di, di Indonesia. Uh, sekarang bagi kami, uh, percepatan yang dilakukan, saya kira uh, percepatan-percepatan untuk kemudian perubahan, uh, sorry, transisi energi yang akan dilakukan tanpa kemudian melihat uh, problem-problem matik secara fundamental, itu juga akan menciptakan masalah baru, terutama baik kemudian kerusakan lingkungan seperti uh, industri-industri tambang yang ada di Sulawesi, termasuk perkebunan perkebunan uh, kelapa sawit yang ada di Indonesia yang jumlahnya uh, hampir 17 juta hektar uh, yang terus kemudian dikuasai oleh segelintir uh, orang uh, itu memberikan dampak di mana kemudian uh, tidak menciptakan lapangan pekerjaan yang cukup besar tanpa ada perubahan-perubahan secara fundamental di soal-soal yang yang berhubungan dengan yang saya sebutkan tadi transisi energi yang dilakukan itu hanya hanya menjalankan kemudian proyek-proyek yang didasarkan dari pendanaan-pendanaan asing uh, modal asing sehingga kemudian itu akan semakin menambah uh, masalah-masalah uh, baru bagi masyarakat Indonesia secara keumuman untuk itu kalau menurut GSBI tentu kemudian Uh, apa yang sudah didokumentasikan oleh pemerintah di dalam roadmap-nya uh, yang kemudian sangat syarat masalah yang yang kemudian berkaitan dengan uh, kelangsungan dari pekerjaan-pekerjaan yang harusnya didapatkan oleh masyarakat termasuk kemudian menjaga lingkungan dan segala macamnya uh, ini harus menjadi satu konsentrasi bagi seluruh uh, sektor yang ada di, di Indonesia untuk kemudian memberikan satu uh, hal baru Bagaimana kemudian transisi energi ini dilakukan betul-betul dengan cara adil yang mengubah seluruh tata kelola kemudian basis daripada uh, pekerja uh, sorry basis daripada problematik yang kemudian uh, banyak mensyaratkan uh, sedikitnya lapangan pekerjaan itu yang 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 dibuka karena penguasaan lahan yang berjuta-juta hektar oleh uh, segelintir orang yang kemudian itu dilakukan dengan uh, tenaga kerja yang yang dengan upah murah. Saya kira hal-hal itu juga akan mendirikan uh, satu masalah yang 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 sangat fundamental ketika tidak disentuh oleh seluruh masyarakat yang lainnya. Uh, itu transisi energi yang akan dilakukan hanya sia-sia, saya kira, karena hanya akan uh, memberikan masalah baru bagi masyarakat Indonesia. Uh, saya kira itu mungkin. Ya, terima kasih Pak uh, atas insight-nya yang sangat uh, raw ya dari lapangan juga eh, dari rekan-rekan di buruh yang ada di industri ekstraktif. Uh, maybe we can move on to other speakers that would like to uh, share their uh, concluding statement and final thoughts. Uh, maybe I can go ahead. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I think. Uh, I think I want to emphasize that a lot of these conversations are also they come to the forefront and you find them in, um, you know, headlines and newspapers and like lots of coverage around the cops. So when it's November, December, and every, like the whole world is getting is getting together to discuss uh, the climate change convention and what kind of agreements are um, are going to be put forward by each country. And so we end up hostage to a calendar uh, that's coming from above when the actual effects and the problems, they're happening every day. So it, it's important for us to be alert to create our own calendars around mobilization. And I think that in the specific element around like labor unions, there's a lot of opportunity to make sure that when you have struggles, there are more localized, it's because of like job benefits or because of job cuts, bringing the conversation around climate and green jobs into it. So you're just not waiting when something else is happening uh, to do that. So like take advantage of your own calendars of struggle, take, take advantage of the situation on the ground and try to build these bridges as well. And I think like there's a lot of opportunities even for people who don't see themselves as part of what could be 
the, a green job to engage with it because they're they're already suffering from the effects of climate change. So there's like room for solidarity if we're not just waiting for these external calendars based on the on the diplomatic agreements and frameworks. Right. Uh, great. Thanks, Sabrina. Maybe final words from Hawan or Sofia. Oh, sorry. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I'll be happy to. Um, uh, you know, I, I think in India, there are these uh, social and economic realities that are layered. Uh, and I think in most of the South Asian countries, so India specifically based on caste and class and poverty and gender and patriarchy and all of this intersects. So how can we create avenues for transformation from the grassroots itself is, is a question that we can ask. Um, and, you know, uh, I think one of the things uh, that I, I've heard from workers here is that we want to create uh, we want to turn our challenges into opportunities. And I think they, there will be many opportunities that come out of this process. And the world is here to collaborate um, and finding the right pathways, you know, for for labor rights and, and uh, labor justice. So um, I think uh, collaboration and, and, and what other uh, solutions that can arise from grassroots, you know, from from bottom to top, like like we like we've discussed. So, um, yeah, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Pawan. Uh, Flavia, I think you're the one missing. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'll add on to what Bagu said about changing. Uh, the fundamental ways. Uh, so um, I think uh, that the new green economy is developing within the existing labor markets uh, that are plagued by same systemic inequalities. Um, and there needs to be fundamental change uh, at those levels. Otherwise, we end up replicating the same models of extractive uh, fossil fuel economies. Um, and which is where I think unionizing uh, can help workers in demanding uh, sustainable or ethical practices from companies. Uh, grassroots movements are another way uh, which Pawan elaborated. So yes. Yeah. Great. Great. Thank you so much, Flavia, and all of the speakers. Uh, so I think we are, we are reaching uh, at the end of the section. So thank you so much, everyone that has joined us. Uh, I think uh, from our side uh, in the energy transition, we need to see the principle of justice in a very local level where we need to look closer if the workers and communities would gain benefit or experience loss from this transition. This transition also need to assure the participative approach in making policy and influential decision where it affects workers their livelihood and their future. Lastly, the proactive collaboration between government and businesses and the societies are also key to assure the just energy transition. I also catch up some uh, key points uh, regarding to this energy transition that I've learned um, by increasing decent jobs, quality jobs, connecting to other issues and put center social inclusivity. And it is very important to guarantee social protection and human rights in this transition and processes. So before we conclude, we would like to ask all of the participants to fill out the survey and register your name for the e-certificates that we will share after the event. We invite you all again to our next webinar on January 24th uh, that discusses about the work relation and oceans level. Also the final one uh, that would be conducted in January 31st about the cost of comfort. So please check our website for further information. A big thank you to all of the speakers and participants that have shared your valuable insights and experience with us. Um, I think have a good evening to you all and have a great day to you all. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.